tell the audience about how you got started in real estate? Welcome to the show. I'm excited to have someone on here to talk about mobile home parks. They're kind of the original affordable housing, and I think a lot can be done in the space, and you're you're doing it. Thanks, Tanner. Appreciate you uh, setting this up and excited to be here. So I want to start with kind of the power of social media. At one point, you own the Instagram handle at real estate, and you actually found your co-GP partner that you're uh, still doing deals with today um, through the hashtag mobile home park. So let's start with that and then kind of give a little backstory on who you are and where you came from. Okay. So that, that's kind of a uh, interesting way to recap that. I, uh, I was working at a debt and equity shop in the city called HKS and uh, struck a friendship with a guy who he owned the at real estate handle and a uh, buddy of mine. And we were sort of like posting certain things to that account. Uh, but I did meet my now business partner um, on social media. I, um, like I said, was doing debt and equity deals in the city. And Nick, uh, my now business partner, was working on a deal uh, for his principal at his company. And I guess he just sent me a direct message. I was um, always sort of posting deals that we were working on at HKS as a company. And, uh, yeah, Nick sent me a direct message, asked me if he would, if, if I would review a deal for him, uh, to assist him with the financing of that deal. And, you know, from there, uh, was kind of born a, a friendship, uh, which lasted a couple of years. If you work in commercial real estate in New York city, it's a pretty small space. And Nick and I became friends and within a couple of years of that friendship, just both sort of reach a juncture where we both kind of felt that we wanted to go out on our own and take a swing at, at owning real estate. And that was when Pioneer Communities was was born um, almost a year ago to the day. And so you are strictly doing multi uh, manufactured housing across kind of the Sun Belt. Um, kind of how how did you come to the realization that you wanted to do mobile home parks? Kind of by chance, I would I would say like the the both Nick and myself um, prior to buying our first mobile home park had heard of mobile home parks. Um, his dad, who is a broker um, up in the Hudson Valley, had advised a client on the sale of a mobile home park, and I remember he remarked to Nick just the amount of offers that came in and kind of blew his mind. And me at HKS, I recall I had a, a colleague who was working on the refinancing of a mobile home park. And I just recall that the terms of the debt were, were coming in um, extremely accretive to the, to the borrower. And, you know, both of those events sort of positioned us um, in a way where, where I guess we were interested in the asset class, but we didn't really have a keen understanding of the asset class. And so when we first originally launched Pioneer Communities, um, by the way, this was not a, a glamorous venture. I mean, Nick and I were meeting every single day, working 12, 13, 14 hour days uh, in his apartment in Nomad while his roommates were in the office. And we were just cold calling real estate owners, underwriting deals, um, getting offers out, trying to figure out what we wanted to buy. And yeah, at that time at inception, day one, our, our original business plan was just like, let's buy multifamily deals in the boroughs because that's what we know best. And uh, none of those offers really were landing. They weren't materializing. And then somewhere there along the way, probably in month two or so, um, somebody, a mentor, was on the phone and was basically just talking about manufactured housing. And I guess that probably pinged the memory for both of us where Nick's dad had brokered a deal and I had seen a colleague work on the refinancing of a deal. And we were just like, huh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe this is something we should take a look at. So fast forward a couple of months and we had now, uh, pretty much driven every single mobile home park in the Hudson Valley in New York. We would 
um, rent a car or use a car of a friend and drive up in four parks and meet with owners. And we finally got our first couple of deals under contract. We had about 600 lots under contract. And uh, that was also right around the time in 2019 when the new rent regulation was passed in, in New York. And we, we you know, had these deals under contract and we kind of looked at each other and we're just like, is this the best first deal for us and our investors? Um, and ultimately, we decided that it would be too much risk um, for us to do as our first deals and it wouldn't have been fair uh, to our LPs. And so we elected to walk from those deals. And it was kind of bittersweet. I mean, you're you know you're grinding uh, day in and day out for six months, and and you finally execute a contract, and you're excited about it. And then this new rent regulations passed, and you have to take a really hard look at the business plan that you originally intended to implement, and ask yourself the really hard question: like, is is this the right decision now with all this information I have? And the answer was no for us. So. We walked uh, from these 600 lots that we had under contract, and, and hindsight's always 2020. And I'm grateful that we walked. At the time, I probably wouldn't have said that, but um, we knew it was the right decision. And what that did was, you mentioned the Sun Belt. What what that did, walking from New York and the new rent regulation, um, it put our eyes onto the southeast. So whereas we were we were pretty much exclusively canvassing the northeast up until that point simply because we had proximity so we could get in the car and go toward these assets pretty quickly um, we were now getting visibility in the southeast so we started evaluating markets like Georgia and South Carolina North Carolina and finally um, six months later from there so now 12 months from inception uh, we closed on our first deal, which was a 170 lot mobile home park right outside of Savannah, Georgia, in a town called Hinesville, and uh, that was our first deal. We we closed on that deal um, in 2019, about 12 months after we we launched the company, and uh, immediately following the closing, Nick and I moved on site. So we we moved to Hinesville, Georgia, and we've lived. Um, at the mobile home park for about three months and basically just oversaw the entire CapEx plan, um, transition of ownership, uh, improvements, upgrades, I mean, management, every single thing. We just sort of immersed ourselves in the asset class and kind of viewed it as learning a new language. If you want to learn a new language, the best way to do that is go live in that country for a couple months. Um, you'll be fluent before you know it. And we sort of implemented the same type of thought process here. We were like, we've never bought one of these things before. So let's just immerse ourselves in it and kind of drink from a fire hose, if you will, for the next three months and learn the ins and outs of the business, which which is what we did. And you mentioned you started with a 170 lot community. Why didn't you start with like a 10, a 12 or a 15? You know, that's a pretty big... I don't know what the purchase price looked like, but I'm assuming that's a big purchase, you know. So why didn't you start a little smaller? Yeah, it was. Um, and that's 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 an interesting question. I think for for us, especially given that this deal was a flight from from Manhattan, um, the efficiencies of of scale and having a larger community were were extremely accretive, just travel expenses going down there. Um I'd say that we probably would have acquired something smaller and it just, you know, this was the one that happened to land. So we were obviously extremely excited at the time. I mean, 170 lots was, was a incredible first acquisition. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful that we did start out on the larger side, I suppose you would say, uh, because it taught us a lot. So this was a community, uh, with a heavy park owned home inventory, there was a lot of vacancy. There was a lot of riffraff at the community itself. Um, there were a lot of residents who were not following any type of rules or regulations. Uh, were paying rent in cash. There was just no, there was no management process at the community, and so I think it was actually a, an incredible first deal for us um, because it had all of this hair on it, and you know there were water lines that needed to be replaced. There were leaks, like. If there was something going wrong at a community, it was going wrong at this community. And so it was kind of fantastic because it it allowed us to see all of these issues um, firsthand. And so instead of just reading about them, we were able to experience them firsthand. And I think it, it made us um, 
really well equipped and well positioned for for deals that would come on in the future. So you talked about a lot of park owned homes in that community. How do you look at the park owned homes versus the tenant owned homes? Like, is that a big factor for you? Yeah, I I would say that it it is it's a factor and more so um, from a from a financing perspective. Like, it depends. A, what type of market you're in, and B, if you think that you can convert those homes over to lot rentals, which um, just, again, opens up the doors to debt liquidity in the agency markets. Um, a lot of, all, all of the agencies will not lend on a park that is you know primarily park-owned home. And so part of the business plan could be, if the market supports those types of turnovers, is, is to turn homes that are park-owned homes over to tenant-owned homes. Um, but I, I would say that at a, at a high level, we we are pretty agnostic. Like our acquisitions criteria is extremely agnostic, park owned, tenant tenant owned, um, so long as and this was a lesson we learned, <laughs> so long as the homes are newer and in decent shape. Uh, that was not the case with this community. A lot of these homes were older. A lot of them needed to be demolished. Um, a lot of them were just simply beyond a point of of repair. They weren't salvageable at all. But I think that acquiring a park with a newer home stock of park-owned homes in the early to mid to late 2000s um, can prove to be extremely accretive because you now have more upside in converting those homes. You've got good cash flow coming in from the rentals. Um, you could go to tenants and LTO them. And so there, there's upside. Sorry, what's LTO? Uh, LTO just stands for lease to own. So. You could go to a resident um, who, who's renting a home from you and just say, hey, you know, you're paying $1,000 a month right now for rent and you're you're literally throwing that money out the window. Um, why don't we do this? Let's call the home, you know, a $20,000 home. Um, you pay us $5,000, 10000 in cash as a, as a down payment effectively. And then instead of that, thousand dollars a month that you're paying in rent let's bifurcate it differently let's let's say that you're still paying five hundred dollars a month in lot rent but then let's call that other five hundred dollars a lease to own payment and so you're you're paying down the home effectively over time and so let's say that after five six seven years of that tenant making those payments um they now own their home and so now you've successfully converted a park-owned home over to a tenant-owned home which again less operating expenses, less of a, of a managerial headache, and also opens up the doors to agency financing. How management intensive is or are mobile home parks? And I know that's kind of a big question or a loaded question, but you know, a lot of people, they say, oh, I buy apartments because of the quality of tenant, and they kind of stigmatize mobile home communities. How do you think about the management intensity or, you know, how, how do you manage these assets? Right. So I, I think the answer to that question can vary. I mean, if we talk about the deal that we just detailed in Hinesville, Georgia, I would say that that was extremely management intensive. Um, and a large part of that reason was, I mean, there, there were multiple reasons, but I would say that the largest piece of, of that reason was the number of park owned homes, but then also the, the age of those park owned homes. Um, and then we also inherited a fair amount of residents who, like, these aren't, I don't believe that there's bad people. Like, th th these aren't bad people. These are simply people who've been living in a very dilapidated state, um, not like their personal state, but just the greater community is in a dilapidated state. And it's like that broken window theory where, you know, suddenly you're in a neighborhood and one neighbor stops taking care of their house and there's a broken window. And, six months later, like the entire neighborhood looks that way. And so, you know, I don't know that I would point the finger to like these people and say these were bad tenants, but I think they had been living in an environment that just didn't allow them to grow. And so there was that. And so you're, you're dealing with a lot of residents who were just super challenging. Um, again, not because they're bad people, but because the living conditions in which they were in due to, you know, prior ownership and lack of hands-on management um, was such. So, I think to answer your question, um, management certainly varies community to community. We have communities that run very smoothly. Um, a large part of that equation, it has a lot to do with who 
the on-site professional team is. Um, so we, we've learned that over the years as well, just the importance of hiring right and making sure that the right people are in the right seats. When the right people are in the right seats, um, things do tend to hum pretty well. And so you do all in-house maintenance, right? You don't third party. We, we do. That's correct. Um, so when, when Nick and I originally launched the company, I think we were wearing a lot of hats, um, which is sort of just a, a, a necessity as a, you know, young entrepreneur. Um, so, you know, one day I'd be focused on acquisitions and then the next day he'd be focused on acquisitions and then I would take over management. Um, and we were just sort of bouncing around. And I think in that process, we learned that I, I tended to be a little bit, um, I don't want to say better, but just my, my skill set like was more accretive to sourcing deals and, um, finding us new acquisitions. And Nick was way more skilled on the management side of the business. And so we sort of sat down and we're just like, look, this is your vertical and this is my vertical and, and here's how we're going to grow effectively. Like you're going to trust me to do well in this vertical. I'm going to trust you to do well in yours. And once we bifurcated roles and responsibilities a little bit more clearly, um, things really started to, to pick up. And so the way that we manage right now is Nick oversees a team. Uh, we have a regional manager, we have a director of sales and marketing, um, and they oversee with Nick as well and our two other partners in Atlanta um, who, who serve more in, in an asset management sort of capacity. They're not necessarily speaking to our property managers. Um, and what we've what we've done is we've curated individual teams at each community. So there's a management team, there's a maintenance team, and there's a sales team. And all of those roles, because obviously a person who is client facing and and sales is is their day to day, is going to have a very different responsibility and personality too uh, than somebody who is repairing um, residents' requests or making, you know, maintenance calls, et cetera. So we've, we've really gotten good at building out these teams at each community. Um, and the way that we manage, like I said, is we're, we're sort of structured in that way where we have the onsite team um, and then the onsite team reports to our regional and our director of sales and marketing who report to Nick, who kind of oversees the, the entire management platform. So how did you learn, again, kind of another loaded question, but I mean, this is a pretty big undertaking going from, you know, a job in private equity or, you know, capital markets to running an actual organization. How did you, at a high level, how did you learn how to do that? Um, it's a great, really good question. Um, and I, I don't know, like, to, to, to say that, you know, I learned how to do that would, would imply that I'm at some sort of destination or arrival point. And I feel like the learning is, is just constant. Like you're, you're constant, I'm constantly learning. Um, and I think that the lessons that I've learned that, you know, have brought us to, to where we are today. Um, a lot of those lessons came from just having extremely good people, um, around us. So We've got two business partners um, who office in Atlanta, and one of those guys, uh, his name's Scott, and and when we met Scott, he had already done six or seven mobile home park deals, I think maybe a little bit more than that, and he had a, a much better understanding of the asset class than Nick or I did because we hadn't actually acquired a mobile home community yet, and we really learned a lot from him. Um, he helped tremendously with the management and the asset management and the acquisitions and sizing up deals and understanding, you know, where, where we were comfortable transacting. Um, and then, and then at a higher level, like actual management processes for, for the business itself, the company, the corporation. Um, I, I think a lot of that stuff is out there in the form of, of books, um, podcasts, you know, the beauty of that is you don't really have to create it yourself in the sense that, people have already done it and they've documented it and they've written about it. And so you can go pick up a book uh, by Gino Wickman or, or Angela Duckworth or any other person out there who's written a book on the topic of entrepreneurship and how to build out 
you know, proven management processes, um, and you can implement them. And so, you know, right now, for instance, we've been going back and forth with, as we continue to grow and scale and really create an organization. So like not, we've always said, we don't want to be a deal shop. There, there's nothing wrong with being a deal shop, but, um, that's just not our vision. Our vision is to have a company. Uh, where people want to come work at. And so we're, we're building out this organization. And I think 2024 will be a fantastic year to do that. And uh, we're going to be rolling out a um, operating system, an internal operating system. And, and we've retained a group that this is all that they do. And they're going to help us implement some of these systems and processes uh, where we just have extremely measurable goals, weekly goals, monthly goals, quarterly goals, um, annual goals, 10-year goals and help us to, to really build that culture. What do those goals look like? On a tenure, um, our vision, I think, is to become the premier owner-operator developer of manufactured housing communities. And so really building scale um, at a nationwide level, which we've certainly done well over the last couple of years in terms of, of deals and how we've grown, but I think right now we're at this juncture where we want to go to the next level. So that means like 10,000 lots. That means um, becoming, like I said, a prominent owner of manufactured housing communities. Um, there's sort of the, these lot count is, is kind of this metric that a lot of folks use. And I think when you're sub that one, you're sub a thousand lots, um, you know, you, you've certainly got some good traction and, and you're, you're moving and then you know, the next metric would be like 5,000 lots, which is kind of like right where, where we're breaching. Um, and then above 5K, I mean, it's, it, you know, 10,000 lots is a lot of lots. Um, and so our goal, I think, as a company is to continue growing internally by hiring good people who are in the right seats. And it's offering affordable housing to more people in, in America who need it. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is by continuing to acquire and develop communities around the country. I want to get into the development stuff a little bit later, but kind of from a you know an, an ethical standpoint, um, there was a large NPR campaign a few years ago about you know private equity buying up, and you know there were a lot of bad actors who were just going in there, not impacting the community in any positive sense whatsoever, and just raising the rents and kind of being slumlords. And the unfortunate part with bubble home parks is these tenants are are victim to this you know they're low income likely low uh less educated how do you think about the ethical side of this you know a lot of people might who don't know your business might say oh you're just you know raising rents on poor people what are some of the values that you implement or i guess how do you think about the ethical side of it yeah it's a fantastic question um i would answer it by by saying that I don't know that like manufactured housing is the first and last industry uh, to have bad players in it. I, I think I think you can find bad players in every industry. Um, I think if you look at 2008 and and what happened there, um, bad players were were at the helm of that. Um, I think you could say right, but they like. And I think you know you can again. I think you can find bad players in every single industry. I think. What's interesting about industries like affordable housing or the drug and alcohol treatment space, right? Where, where you could do Google searches here, um, and you find people in Florida who are operating drug and alcohol treatment centers in extremely um, like unethical ways, right? Um, and you, you find the same thing in affordable housing where this is a sensitive segment of the population. Um, it's a sensitive segment of the population. And I think that operating in a sensitive segment of the population, you have to be more ethical, not less. Um, I think what, from what I've seen, at least people who come in and acquire communities and jack up rents day one, I, I don't know that those folks have the same vision as we do. I, I think when I talk to you about our vision being on a 10, 20, 30 year scale, like I, we're not just flipping properties. We're, we're not buying deals, jacking up the rents and then exiting in 12 months. Um, 
our our vision as a company is to assemble, own, operate a portfolio of turnkey communities for for the long term. And so, when I look at our vision, it it simply just is not. There's two there's two components here. Like a, it's not advantageous for us to implement unethical rent increases at a community, given the fact that we plan to own and operate for the long term. Um, building bad rapport with existing residents just wouldn't feed that vision. Um, and then B, going back to the importance of just who you are as a person. I, I mean, I can comfortably say that everybody who works at Pioneer is a good person. And that is is not something that we take lightly. I think everybody who we want working here shares our vision, our values, um, which are extremely important to us. And so I think we've created a, a really good machine that operates with these values. Um, and I think that when you mix that with our long-term vision, which is to own and operate communities for the long term, it just it's, it doesn't make sense for us to manage them in the ways that maybe some people have. Um, and I think it's just important to, to be really sensitive to the fact that like we're providing a service to a segment of the population that is oftentimes overlooked. And so with that, we have an even greater responsibility. Um, so the way that we view rent increases, which are, are a part of the business, right? They're, they're a part. I mean, a lot of people just kind of focus on that, but they're a part of the business. Um, the way that we have implemented those historically is in a, in a very specific sort of fashion. So when we acquire a community, the first thing that we're doing is not increasing rents. The first thing that we're doing is we're investing whatever amount of capital we have underwritten for that deal. And the way that that translates into physical upgrades is new roads, new homes, landscaping, signage, uh, upgrades to the office, um, you know, a full like on-site team. If there's space for amenity upgrades, we're going to install playgrounds. Um, so we're, we're going in and we're spending real money and we're improving the community so that when we do go to residents and say, hey, you know, your rent hasn't been increased in six years and we're $300 below market, uh, we're going to do like a $20, you know, community-wide increase this year, even though I know you guys haven't had an increase in like six years. Um, it's something that's absorbable. It's something that's not just coming out of left field. It's kind of like a quid pro quo where you are building that good rapport by acquiring a community, investing significant amounts of capital into it, improving the lives of the residents. And then it's like, okay, well, you know, we're still below market when we implement this $20 rental increase, but on a go forward basis, you know, rents are going to grow 5% annual, something to that effect, right? So we're not going in and buying a park and jacking rents up $200 day one, um, simply because it's just A, not who we are as people, but B, it's also not accretive to our business when you look at the long-term vision. I love it. That's awesome. Let's walk through kind of a fastball deal for you. Uh, again, I want to get into the development stuff, but we'll talk existing assets. So you're kind of all across the country. Uh, how do you even begin to look at a site? You know, How do you get to know the market? What, you know, how are you underwriting it? How are you sourcing it typically? How are you financing it? Uh, let's kind of just walk through that. Yeah, that, that's that's a fantastic question. Again, you got some good questions today. Uh, this, this that's is great. Um, well, again, like th this is not like the answer to this. It's so varied, uh, especially the the financing component and, and the underwriting component, but backing up to just deal selection and market selection. Um, we don't have, you know, one specific target market. And the reason for that is that we're in a massive affordable housing crisis right now that's impacting the entire country. So there isn't just like one specific market that needs new quality affordable housing. It's a nationwide pandemic. And so the way that we, you know, I would talk to you the same way I would to a broker who is helping us source deals. Um, I would say that we're not reinventing the wheel. So if DR Horton, Lennar, Pulte, any of the other big boy single family home developers are building homes and selling single family homes uh, north of $200,000, 
that's a market, assuming that there's good population growth, um, that's a market that we would probably feel pretty good about our thesis around affordable housing. Because I love the simplicity it, of that, by the way. Be, right. That's I mean, great. it has to be that simple. I could go into every single market in the Southeast and the Midwest and and tell you that we need to be at, you know, sub five or above five percent uh population growth year to year and we need to have a county population of 100k plus and we need to be within one mile of a walmart super center or whatever but like at the end of the day it's all bullshit, right though. i mean our thesis yeah. like when when i think when you fine-tune your criteria so like um in in such a really specific way you're not going to do any deals and really at the end of the day like our thesis is centered around affordable housing. And so if there is a need for affordable housing in that market, which typically we define by what is the average single family home price and what are they being built for and what are they being sold for? If, if that market supports um, our homes, which would sell between 65 to you know, 110, 115K on the high end, um, that's a market we feel good about going into. And so for, for actual like geographies, I'd say we're generally pretty agnostic. I mean, we've got offers out right now on deals all over the country, but these all these markets have one thing in common, and it's that they have a need for affordable housing. Are there any non-starters for you on that? Like, would you, are there any markets that you won't go to or any components of a mobile home park that are just like, sorry, we're not a good fit for? Um... Yeah, I mean, I think I think that if there is a, because occupancy is not a non-starter for us. We actually love infill deals, um, especially if the market supports the absorption. Um, you know, a failing utility system would would be challenging for us. Um, but private utilities don't scare us. We're under contract on a, on a deal right now that's like 200 lots and it's serviced by private utilities and we're totally comfortable with it. Um, we've met with the, the operators of that utility system and appears to be in great shape. Um, we own parks that are serviced by private utility systems. So utilities, so long as they're in good working order, um, we're sort of agnostic on that. I think the, the one thing that you can't really solve for both things that you can't underwrite for, like rent control and, and things of that nature, I won't name any <laughs> particular states or anything, but there are certain <laughs> states that are just very challenging to operate these types of assets in for, for a number of reasons. Those are things that you can't underwrite for. And another challenging thing is if you have a park with a high amount of tenant-owned homes, meaning you don't own the homes, and those homes are older. So those homes are like 1970s, 1980s, they're dilapidated. The issue that arises there is like, let's say that that park's 70% full, 75% full. What, what does that park look like when you have gone in and spent all this money to infill those vacant lots with brand new homes? What, what does the final net curb appeal look like when you inherited 75% of the park uh, with, you know, these older homes. So like that's that's a tough thing to solve for, right? Because you don't have control over that inventory. Um, now, if you flip-flop that problem and those are all park-owned homes, that's totally different because you own those homes. So you could just demolish them, remove them, whatever. Um, so that's kind of a weird situation where actually we would prefer to probably have park-owned homes versus tenant-owned homes, which is generally not, not the case. Hint. Fascinating. Okay. So like I send you a deal in say Nashville or something like that. You, do you fly out to every, are you like walking the side every time? Or are you looking around anything specific that you're looking yeah. for? So we, we are actually right now in the process of um, redoing our whole website, which is very exciting. It's a massive investment that we're making. Uh, and we plan to roll that out in Q1 of, of 2024. And on there, uh, we're, we're coming out, we're rolling out this pioneer purchasers pledge. And this is something that we've done on every single deal, but it's something that we want to make other people aware of that we do, because I think it's important. Um, so yeah, within all of our agreements, our LOIs do stipulate that within, 
usually five days of, of a consummated LOI, uh, an executed LOI will be on site. But usually we're on site well, well before that. So you send us a deal in Asheville, there's a deal to be had, basis sounds interesting, market checks out, size is good. Um, I'm about three hours from Asheville, three and a half hours. I mean, I'll be there this afternoon. Um, we, we, we move quickly and it's the reason we moved from Manhattan to Charlotte, North Carolina is so that we can do that. Um, so that we can be on site quickly, shake somebody's hand and get to know them. And, and we have found that one of the most effective ways I think to get deals done is meeting with ownership on site as quickly as possible. And that's, that's our responsibility as buyers. Um, and so we're rolling that out in a more formal way with this new website, which I'm, I'm very excited about. Can we go a little bit more into detail on that pioneer promise? Like, why should I send you a deal versus you know someone else? Yeah, I mean, I th- I think we we really like we 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 pride ourselves on, and I I guess priding yourself on reputation is sort of an oxymoron. We 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 have like <laughs> we've created a very good reputation for ourselves. I think in the industry um, as a group that is institutional in certain ways, but entrepreneurial in others. And the way that we operate um, just kind of vibrates with that mix of institutional approach and entrepreneurial vision. And we we have, I mean, a plethora of letters, um, reference letters from, from previous sellers who we've had the opportunity and the privilege of, of working with. And I think what really sets us apart is our emphasis on the relationship. So um, and we're going to actually include all of these uh, in our website, which which is really cool. There there will be um, a bunch of testimonials from past sellers, and we always encourage folks to reach out to these sellers um, because to this day we still retain friendships with a lot of them. Um, and the reason why that is such is because we have done what we said we were going to do. So when we bought these deals originally. They're like, well, you know, we've got like 10 other bidders. Why the heck should we go with you? And we kind of talked to them about what our plans are for the property. We're like, well, we are planning to like move to Huntsville, Alabama for four months and like turn this thing around ourselves. Um, I mean, we've got skid steers lined up. We've got people who are coming in with landscaping and we're going to tear this down and replace it. And we're going to make this improvement and that upgrade. And they're like, well, that sounds interesting. Um, and I think a lot of folks will make those promises, but they won't deliver. And and we've delivered. I mean, we that's like what we love to do is turn these assets around. And so the reason why a lot of these relationships with previous sellers are still in place is because they can tour the community three, four, five months after closing. And they're like, wow, like these guys really knocked it out of the park. Um, so, I, you know, I mean, listen, everybody should should do deals with who they feel best doing deals with, but I can say that our track record as a purchaser um, has been has been tremendous. And I think that that's a function of us really doing what we say we're going to do. And again, like, you know, those aren't my words. I, I have a lot of sellers who we've had the privilege of working with. That's their words. And, and we plan to distribute those words to the public so that they can see it. Because I can tell you that We'll do something, but I think it's probably more powerful if you hear it from people who, who've already witnessed it. I want to bring this home by talking about the future of Pioneer, what you kind of look at uh, for the market over the next couple of years, and also getting into the development space. Um, because, you know, a lot of these communities were built in, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, I assume. And a lot of municipalities have said, hey, we don't want any more of that. But you are actually going out there currently and uh, <clears throat> trying to do some development. So let's talk about yeah, that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very exciting topic for us. Um, I think, I mean, back in 2018, when we launched this thing, um, the, the, the dream was always like, let's develop something. I mean, that would be fascinating. Um, but for a number of reasons, that wasn't really something that maybe economically made sense. There were a ton of acquisitions for, for existing MH communities coming across our desk. And um, the second component of that was also like lot rents were never really at a place that 
justified development um, from, from an economic lens. Like you just couldn't really get to the types of yields that you could if you bought something that was existing. And so things have changed, right, over over the last couple of years where um, what was once an extremely fragmented industry, like there's obviously been a lot of new institutional capital pouring into the space. Um, not to say that the entire industry has been consolidated by any means, but like to find a 200 or 250 lot or even 170 lots like our first deal uh, in a good market with upside and uh, you know, th those deals are much more challenging to come by. And then you throw in all of the inefficiencies in the capital markets that we've experienced over the last 18 months. And um, there there haven't been that many opportunities that pencil. Everybody talks about a bid-ask spread, like that's still there. And I think 18 months ago or so, um, we started looking at land. We, we started to really evaluate the economics behind developing MH. And we had heard that a few groups were doing it um, Sun Communities being one of them and Stonetown Capital uh, in Denver, one of our partners on our Auburn Opelika portfolio. Um, you know, people were doing it and um, it kind of got our, our, our wheels churning here at Pioneer. We were like, well, um, lot rents are not what they were in 2018. And so $500 a month for, for lot rent in certain markets is achievable. Um, stabilized product that was built in the 70s is trading at like 150k a lot in some markets and that product was built in the 70s so what if if we can make sure that our cost basis is 80 to 90k a lot inclusive of land hard soft costs um and and we feel like we can achieve a good healthy law rent in that market what what would a brand new community trade for that was developed in you know 2022 at the time that we were having this conversation? Um, so we started to like really it was a math problem, right? I mean, if, if we can develop for 90 and stuff that was built in the 70s is trading for 150, like that we we felt good about about the math and um, especially the the lot rents and the growth of those lot rents over time. Um, and so it sort of just caused a bit of a shift in, in us as a company. And we started to look at land sites. We started to underwrite them. We, we've now present day assembled a portfolio of about five um, entitled sites spanning about 2,300 lots or so. And our, our plan on a go forward basis, I think, which we call Pioneer V2 is, is really like a secondary phase of our business where we want to go out and develop these communities at scale and talk about vision, five, 10 year goals. Like we, we literally want to go out and assemble a portfolio of 10,000 brand new lots. And I think that that's becoming more and more the vision um, here at Pioneer to be able to develop turnkey class A affordable housing, uh, meaning fully amenitized, effectively developed to the same exact standards as any of the DR Lennar projects out there, 5,000 square foot lots, fully amenitized with club rooms, fitness centers, dog parks, pickleball courts, um, things that when these communities were being developed in the 70s just didn't really exist. And so I think more and more today, like that's where we see the future of our business gravitating towards is on these ground up development projects. I mean, you got me <laughs> excited. Um, that sounds awesome. Are there any companies that you, you know, 10 years down the road, who do you look up to as a company? Maybe not mobile home park related, but are there any, who are your idols or not your idols, but your, um, where do your ambitions go? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, I could probably name a, a lot of companies that I admire personally and, and who have sort of paved the way. And, um, I think though, like the, the, the common thread amongst all those companies is that the the individuals who are leading those companies are are being innovative. Um, they're good people. They're ethical people. They're value driven people. And I think at the end of the day, like they're they're doing good. So they're improving the lives or creating a service that allows somebody to improve their lives if they consume that service or acquire that service. So there, there's just a massive value add. And so the, the, the 
companies and individuals um, who I'm thinking of, and there's probably a long list, like the common thread is that. It's that these individuals have found something that when they bring it out to the public and to the world, it is creating a greater good. And at the end of the day, like if you're doing that, you're, you're, you're on a great track. I mean, because that's all we're really called to do as human beings here is just like try to leave this place a little bit better than we found it. And uh, if we can make a small dent in this affordable housing crisis that we face, um, I, think, I think that would be a, a pretty big win for us. Man, we got to get you back on in a year or yeah, two. Love that. This was this was fun. Thanks for coming on, man. So awesome.